You're listening to Coding Blocks, episode 146. Subscribe to us and leave us a review on iTunes. Well, not Stitcher anymore, but maybe Spotify still. <laughs> you know, hey, I tell you what, just find it. And if you can leave a, a star or a thumbs up or a plus or a review, whatever they allow, we'll take it. All right, and codingbox.net, check it out. You can find show notes, example discussion, and a lot more. And you can send your feedback, questions, and rants to comments at codingblocks.net. You can follow us on Twitter at codingblocks or head to www.codingblocks.net. And you can find all our social links there on the top of the page. And with that, I am the guy who says the irritating www dubs. I'm Alan Underwood. <laughs> I'm Joe Zach. And I'm Michael Outlaw. All right, and today we're talking about game jams, uh, which is uh, something I think we're all we're all kind of no on right now, or like no, 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 right? In terms of we've never all we've never done one of them before. I, I would agree with that assessment. All right, but it's going to be an excellent episode anyway. Was in reference to like if you knew about it, right? Yeah, I, I know nothing about it. Yeah, so we're, we're I think we're yes, no, no. Okay, all right. Well, there you have. It. <laughs> Let's move on to the news. <laughs> All right. So as always, we like to say thanks to those who have taken the time to leave us a review. And on iTunes, um, Outlaw wanted me to stumble over these today. So it looks like we have Abhishek in 12, uh, Sheikh Poster Batorin, uh, Herkamer's Dad, and Bamers 22. So thank you all for leaving those reviews. And I think it was Bamers 22 that brought up the, the great way that the dub, dub, dub is said. So, you know, well, but he also said that nobody actually types it though, but <laughs> right. I want to point out though, that while you're, you're fine to not type it and it's fine for websites to uh, default and automatically redirect you, it still is important. Like, you know, anyone who has done any kind of SEO work, will tell you there's a big difference in in Google's mind in regards to www.codingblocks.net versus codingblocks.net. Yep. Yep. Each each one has their own page ranks. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah. And that's why we kept we kept it consistent. All right. And hey, uh gotta throw out there too. So we're gonna be talking about game jams today, but we're also gonna be running one in uh, January. So we're looking at 2021. We're done 2020. We're looking toward the future and we're looking at basically uh, January 21st to the 24th running uh, a game jam, which we're going to tell you all about this episode. So that's going to be super exciting and super awesome. And as kind of part of rolling that out and getting some information out with the website, we set up a new page that you can go to right now at codingblocks.net slash events that has a uh, scheduled event. So things like, uh, like the virtual happy hours, which I haven't been great at publicizing and things like the game jam, uh, things like live streams. Uh, if we're going to be at a conference or something or giving a talk somewhere, then this be, be the place to go to. So it's got like a calendar. Uh, it might even have a feed up there. So you can add it to your calendar. I'm not sure about that. Uh, if not, I'll get it up there at some point, but anyway, uh, codingbox.events, wait, codingbox.net slash events. <laughs> so terrible. Yeah. Oh, and one last thing, so I've got to tell you too, another way to keep in touch and find out about stuff, of course, you know, we can follow Twitter and social links, blah, 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 but also the mailing list is uh, super great for that stuff. Uh, we run contests there and I uh, will also be posting information about the, the upcoming game jam. So, woo. And, and you can get on that mailing list just by going to codingblocks.net over there on the right side. It'll be a thing to put in your name and your email. And, you know, we don't spam or anything, so that should be good. Uh, another thing that I just forgot about, because I, we always forget about it, if you want some swag or some some stickers, some, you know, whatever, go to codingblocks.net slash swag, and, and the instructions are there on what you need to do, or reach out to us on Twitter or something. Like, we, we definitely like giving it away, but we always forget to mention it. So, so yeah, definitely check that out. There's a reason why we're not in marketing. <laughs> right. yeah. Why we sit behind a desk at a computer instead of like, you know, being out there like trying to get a brand thing going and right. You know, like, do I use the dub dub dub? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so a little bit of news here, and this is, I just got this email the other day and it was kind of shocking and it's probably worth anybody else knowing because I'd imagine that a lot of us use the service. So Google Photos in June of 2021 is going to start counting 
photos against your space quota. So if you're a user of Google services, I think you get um, 15 gigabytes free. I, I don't even remember what the number is. 15 gig is the free tier. Okay. So 15 gig is the free tier. And what they're saying is everything up until June of 2021 won't count against your quota, but on June, 2021, all photos that are taken that get put up in, in Google photo storage will start counting against your quota. And it's because I forget how many trillions of photos they said they had. Like, it's ridiculous. And when you consider that probably of every 10 photos, there's two of them that are complete trash that you take that you just never go delete. Yeah. Um, so it, it, was, it was really interesting. So I've got a link to their storage changes that they, that they put up in their blog. Um, probably worth going and checking out if you are a user of that service. Well, I guess this is like really just an indication that uh, they're, they're helpful hints to like, hey, you want to delete these, right? I guess those didn't work, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh-huh. They would like have, they would suggest the photos like, hey, you probably don't care about this document that you took a picture of, right? You, we, could, we could delete this. Yeah, people are like, nah, man, it's free. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I wonder yeah. like, uh, I guess this is only because this is only applicable to the, uh, the free pictures that they had, right? Or, or is it any, cause like there was, um, when they, when they first started that, that photo service that you could, if you used their like optimized version, their high photo, quality. Yep. Then then it was like unlimited number of photos that you, and that's what they're getting rid of. Because if you wanted to go with like the raw or the original version of, of the photo, then you already had to, that was already counting against you. So it's, it's that free tier, um, of the unlimited where they would like choose how to optimize it, that that's what's getting being gotten rid of. Yeah. Let's be real. What they did is they gathered all the images they needed to make their ML amazing. <laughs> and, and they're done with that now. <laughs> so, so now they're like, thanks for all the free images. <laughs> now you guys are going to pay for storage. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, it is interesting though. I mean, they do have a, they, they do have just, a couple bytes dedicated to these photos because uh, they have they said that they have more than four trillion photos stored in Google Photos, and every week, every week now, they get twenty eight billion with a B, b billion new photos and videos uploaded. And you guys wonder why the polar ice caps are melting. <laughs> It's photo storage. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Hey, um, we also, a little bit of inside baseball here. Oh, somehow, some miracle, we cracked the top 15 of the technology category in Apple. That was kind of brief. <laughs> we <were coming> <laughs> along. So I got pretty quickly, but that was pretty amazing. Cause this is a bunch of like NPR shows and Gimlet shows and Radio Lab shows and WNYC, like a bunch of shows I listened to. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, cool. top fifteen in that category is crazy. That that was truly exciting. For two days, I think we were there, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. Only two days. Well, okay, now I'm sad. It's probably there again. <laughs> I mean, whatever. Right, right, <laughs> right. So uh, on uh, on with the show. So uh, today we're talking about game jams, and uh, the name's a little weird. Um, you know, we've talked about the word jam before and how it can be often. <laughs> <laughs> that of things that are a little bit strange but in this case it's referring to basically like a, a musical jam you know where like people get together and they just kind of make some noise they they freestyle they collaborate and uh, that's actually where the name comes from uh, so the idea was uh, kind of initially just to get people together who have different perspectives different ideas getting like a kind of a theme or challenge and uh, see what they make and so uh, that's what they did in the first one uh, that anyone, uh, you know, kind of the first official version that uh, I could find on the internet happened in 2002, which is not that long ago. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not looking at like 1960 or something. So uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. And then uh, Ludum Dare, which is uh, one of the, the big challenges, the big game jams that we'll be talking about here quite a bit, got started basically the next month after and has been running ever since. So uh, 18 years, Ludum Dare. Great job. And uh, at the heart, we're basically talking about a timed challenge to create and publish video games. So you might uh, sign up to compete in a 48-hour game jam and get started, make a game, throw it up on the internet, and 
maybe there's some sort of voting process. Maybe uh, there's some judges. There's a variety of things that can kind of go down. And the end of it, uh, you theoretically have some sort of game published. Now, I want to clarify like up front. There's a bunch of different one, different kinds. We're going to be talking about like some of the, the kind of the major players and the, the major competitions and styles and rules and stuff. But a lot of them, uh, there's not a. They don't expect you to work forty hours, forty eight hours straight, right? A lot of times, it's um, most of these competitions. It totally expect people to work on them for a short amount of times. <laughs> Sometimes you might have a seven day contest, and people might just work two hours a night for that week in order to kind of publish. And so, I, I think you'll find if you two hours. Say what? Just a total of two hours, or two hours every night? You're saying? Yeah, two hours every night. Two hours total. You. How much is this going to like interfere with my Overwatch time? It's what I'm trying yeah. to get a good feel for. Well, you have to decide that. And I think, you know, one thing that's like pretty obvious, like right off the gate is like, there's some people that could take a week off life and do this. And that's great for them. And there's some people that are going to, you know, have a hard time finding even an hour or two a day. And the, the output of those, it's going to vary pretty wildly. But the big driving force, the kind of spirit behind all of this is to just say, it's okay. It's not about trying to come out with this polished, amazing, you know, it's not a, comp- it's not a competition. It kind of is. But uh, the, the goal here is really just to get something published, and just be creative and have fun and collaborate. And so it doesn't really matter. Okay. So tell me this, cause you set aside the 21st through the 24th of January is what I saw. And that looked like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yep. What, what is your plan with this? Like how many, are we basically taking eight hour days and doing this? Is that what the goal is or what? Whatever you want. So it's four calendar days. It'll be, what's that? Uh, 96 hours. Uh, the contest will be running, which means basically we'll, so, we'll say go at uh, midnight at uh, whatever time zone <laughs> we decide on. And, and uh, all the, the games must be submitted by the end deadline. And then there'll be some sort of like kind of judging phase. And uh, that's it. Okay. All right. And, and yeah. are we going to uh, compete in this as well? So there's several different ways to do the judging. I've got a section coming up here at the end where we can kind of, I fear we kind of talk about our preferences and maybe talk through that a little bit. I thought that'd be kind of fun. Okay. Uh, we, we've got options though. All right, cool. I will let you continue. What, what, what did the publishing, how, like define that though? Like, are you talking about like published to an app store um, or just to the web? Uh, generally it's just to the web. Uh, okay. So sometimes there's, uh, you know, like kind of sponsored game jabs or something that might have like, uh, you know, additional rules for publication. Like maybe, you know, maybe Amazon's trying to get uh, more games in their marketplace or something. And so maybe they'll do something like that. For the most part, though, it's generally just about that kind of free open spirit where you got to get the games uh, up online. But like immediately right off the bat, I'm sure as a programmer, you're thinking like, well, what if it's uh, Windows? What if I write it for iOS? What if it's a web game? Like how are people going to play this? How are people going to, you know, get to experience these things on platforms? Like some of those things require installs. Some of those don't like, it's uh, kind of a jungle. And it, I think, it, you know, overall it's kind of hard to navigate that. And so this is one of those things, like if I hadn't heard about game jazz for so many different people, I would like immediately dismiss it as just too complicated. It'll never work. And uh, luckily for the world, I'm just totally dead wrong. And we'll see some, uh, I've got some numbers here coming up that uh, I think might knock your socks off. Except that I set it up and so now you're probably going to be disappointed. <laughs> what if your socks are already off? Right. I haven't worn socks since March. So That's what I was going to say. Like this, we're in a pandemic. Nobody would wear socks anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, a couple of, a couple of quick things I want to point out before, before we get into the meet here, but um, there's apparently an international game jam conference and I've got a link here too, but uh, it's actually really super big. The, like looking at the pictures, I can't believe uh, that so many people <laughs> like are involved with these sorts of things. I feel like this has been off my radar for so, radar for so long that I'm just like really surprised that I missed such a big deal. And now if you go to this website, indiegamejams.com, does it, does it mean anything right now, though, if it 503s? Right. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, well, it shouldn't. If you Google, Google search for IndieGameJams.com. It's just the link that was there, though, Outlaw. If you just go to the main site, it works better. Oops. Sorry about that. Uh, I love it that the loading animation is a Pac-Man. Yeah. Well, they need that loading animation because... <laughs> 
Do you oh, see oh. how many game jams are running just this week? It's ridiculous. Wow. I am not going to count that. It's going to cr- possible to count that high. It's possible. <laughs> I think so, you need Google Photos to count that high. Yeah, so we're going to go through some of the kind of like the bigger, kind of more major ones, but uh, I wanted to kind of just like kind of come out the gate saying like there are a ton of different game jams for a ton of different reasons on a ton of different sites. And if you go to IndieGameJams.com, of course, we'll have a link in the show notes, you can find a game jam to join uh, any day, any hour, <laughs> any time you want, all different flavors. Like you, Like, I don't know, there's maybe even 100 going on this week that are just on the site alone. What if we said it this way? Like, if game development is your jam, then there's probably going to be uh, plenty of resources for you in this episode that uh, you'll, you'll be able to walk away with all kinds of helpful information. Yep, absolutely. And every single one that I've looked at so far has been, like, I would even say beginner focus. Like, they want people to just come in and make a game. If this is the first time you've ever tried programming, if this is the first time you've ever tried to make a game, uh, then that's like totally encouraged. So I'm sure that you'll find game jams that have like pro developers that kind of pop in there and do really polished, awesome things. And that's great for them. But you're also going to see 14 year olds who, you know, just have a circle popping around the screen and that's fine too. That's great. How about a DOS batch game jam? (laughs) Make a game using only DOS batch for windows. No worries. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, some of these go on for, uh, for a month. Some of these uh, go on for a single day. Here's one that's uh, just uh, Friday night jam. So, yeah, pretty cool. So, uh, that's a great way to find your next game, uh, game jam, and that is tied in with this uh, international conference also, which I had a broken link for, but is also super cool. <laughs> Back when we went to conferences and things. Yeah. So I know I'm doing a lot of talking here, but I promise we'll get into it. But I do want to kind of hit on the most popular game jam. So if you've ever heard of a game jam before, it's a bit on your radar, it's probably going to be one of these. And the top one uh, you probably hear about is Ludum Dare, which is the thing I mentioned at the top of the show. Uh, Ludum Dare got its start very early on uh, in the game jam scene. And Ludum Dare, I actually looked this up, so it stands for to give something a name, basically, in, in Latin. So... <laughs> They just needed a name for this thing that they were trying to do, which is uh, put on games. And it's just an online event. And in this case, ludumdare.com happens every April and every October. It basically spans a weekend. And people will talk about Ludum Dare pretty much all year round. They'll be talking, they'll be thinking about ideas. Ludum Dare does this cool thing where they, um, they start with a, a big batch of theme ideas. And uh, as the weeks get, uh, as the time gets closer and closer to the actual event starting, they'll wean those themes down. So the idea is that you'll say, you'll, you'll look at a big theme, uh, a big list of themes, and maybe it'll be like computers or technology or community or friendship or green animals or, or whatever. And so your mind will start thinking about maybe games that you can make the kind of, uh, what you call it, focus on those ideas. And then, you know, the next week comes up and 20 items drop off the list. The next week comes and 10 more items drop off the list. And then finally, uh, the day before the contest begins, the, the real theme is announced and people go and make games around that theme. And that's really cool because it gets you thinking about kind of, uh, it gives you something to kind of focus on. It gives something, uh, a cool way for to see how other people kind of thought about that theme. But it also keeps people from like totally making a game ahead of time, right? Oh. Well. So you're not flailing around and you don't have five months to build it before everybody else gets a chance to get in there. Yeah. I yeah. like it. Can, can I ask a dumb question though? Of course. Um, no such thing. What I do best. Uh, are, are there like, are, are there any games that I might've heard of that have come out of a game jam? I'm glad you asked or, or something like, or something. So there's uh, there's uh, like niche games and there's certain like certain categories like roguelikes where a lot of games come out of game jams that uh, people who are in those scenes, if you will, uh, are going to be familiar with. But here are the top ones, and I got a list here of like ten kind of popular ones. But here are the ones that I've actually heard of. Uh, Surgeon Simulator. Have you seen this? No. So this game in particular, it kind of seemed to like spark off a whole genre of games, and this is one of those ones where you've got like the two hands on your screen. 
and you'll be trying to commit uh, commit <laughs> do a surgery and uh, say you grab a hammer, but the it's really uh, wonky physics. So these crazy things will happen all the time. So you'll grow to grab the drill and you'll knock over the skeleton in the corner. <laughs> and you'll go to drill, you know, the, whatever procedure you're doing and accidentally hit the person's foot and like just chaos ensues. And so it's, um, it's, you know, pretty funny to call it a simulator. <laughs> I guess it's similar to what would happen if I really tried to do surgery on someone, but uh, you know, it's uh, you, you kind of got to see it to believe it, but it's, it's just total mayhem where you're trying to kind of, bandages the person up and oh the bandage stuck to their eyebrow and you know whatever just crazy stuff happens so it's kind of a, a comedic game uh super hot is another one that's, that's popular in kind of niche circles i don't know alan looks like you've seen that one before i i own that one if you yeah. have a vr headset you absolutely must get that game it is a blast to play so what's it like so uh, super hot is your at least in the virtual world, I think they also have a non VR version of it, but you're basically a person that you enter a room and there's people trying to come kill you. Right. And there will be tools in the room that you can pick up and use. So it might be a gun. It might be a Chinese throwing star. It might be a knife. It might be something. It could just be a bottle, but as you do an action, like if you pull the trigger to shoot, then everything speeds up for a few seconds. And so the people that are attacking you might shoot and, and it's almost like, you know, the matrix that, that cool effect that first was popular in the matrix where the guy did the. Yeah. Yeah. It's that same type thing. So if you do something like go to punch somebody, everything speeds up and somebody might shoot and you'll see the bullet trail coming at you. And so you can sort of like duck to get out of the way of it. It'll go past you and then you can come back and try and do something else. So you're constantly trying to react and, and do this. And it's just a very polygon world. It's, it's very much like uh, if you remember virtual racing back in the Sega days. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's that polygon feel, but it's so it's so interactive and it's so fluid that you truly get worked up and, and it's fun. Like you'll get your blood flowing doing it. I, that's awesome that it came out of one of these game jams. It's seriously, I think it's like 10 bucks, maybe 15 bucks. Like when you buy it totally worth every penny of it. Like you get your money's worth because even if you beat it, it's one of those games that you can go back and just play and play and play. Cause it's just fun. The graphics on it are not serious at all. Like no, that it's very, it's a polygon kind of thing. Like you're not kidding. Like, there's just, you know, whatever shapes it takes to, like, make a human-ish form. But it's so Rare fluid. Triangles, rectangles. Yeah, it's, it's all triangles. It's all polygon-based. But it's really just – and, again, this is, like, one of those things. And I can see how it could grow out of a game jam only because – you don't have a million or, or, or a $50 million budget to try and make some photorealistic um, people coming at you, right? Like this is just about the game. It's really just about the game of for everything you do, their ability speeds up for, for an amount of time, right? So it's like this whole um, push and pull balance of stuff. It, it's, it's really fun. Okay. And uh, I just looked, um, it looks like they've surpassed the selling 2 million uh, – Two million games, and that was uh, from a year ago. So I imagine it's only gone up since then. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, that was the result of Game Jam. You can kind of imagine, too, where like, someone probably had the idea. It's like, well, what if I did the Matrix thing? Let me see if I could do that in a weekend. And they came up with a prototype in the end of it. They were happy with the prototypes. People seemed to really like it. And so they went on and um, made a good bit of money from it. That's awesome. Yep. Uh, so Snake Pass is another one. That was one of the Switch uh, titles that came out um, like really early and uh, did well on Switch. I never played it, though. Man, that one looks super polished. Yeah, it does. It's that nice. one looks really nice. Uh, Gods Will Be Watching is, um, uh, I, this is more my, kind of my wheelhouse, but it's kind of like a, a narrative pixel art game, which just kind of looks a little retro, but it's just neat. It's, uh, it's been really popular. And then uh, there's my favorite here, which is Goat Simulator. Have y'all ever That's, seen Ghost Simulator? I have not played it. That thing is super popular. It pops yeah. up for me on recommended purchases all the time. Yeah. <laughs> now, people love it. They've been playing it for years. Um, and you can just imagine where someone like took this, this game. It's like none of those kind of physics simulators where they basically took a goat and they threw it into a world and uh, had to do crazy stuff. That's it. 
<laughs> you know what's awesome? If you go to their website, goat-simulator.com, at the very bottom of the page, they have a, discl- a disclaimer on the page. Goat Simulator is a small, broken, and stupid game. <laughs> it was made in a couple of weeks, so don't expect a game in the size and scope of GTA with goats. Wow. As a matter of fact, you're better off not expecting anything at all. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. The, uh, oh. oh, go ahead. Uh, go, all you. Yeah, I was going to say that, that first one, the Surgeon Simulator, it reminded me of, like, w- looking at it, I'm, it made me think of, like, Who's Your Daddy? Do you remember that game? Yeah, the octopus, right? No, it, uh, the no, game okay. where, like, uh, one person plays as the baby and another person plays as the dad. It's like a head-to-head. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the baby is trying to do something to <laughs> die, and the, and the dad is trying to keep the baby alive. So, like, the baby would try to, like, you know – climb into the oven or you know, <laughs> stick a fork in the light socket. But like the graphics aren't like, you know, they're, they're, they're not that crazy. They're nothing like, you know, super, super impressive, uh, you know, but they're good. Right? They get the job done. And that's what uh, the surgeon simulator reminded me of looking at it. Maybe me think, like, I wonder if that's where, uh, if who's your daddy came out of a game jam. It might. You know, I just looked at Bug Snacks uh, game coming out for the PlayStation 5 was apparently uh, came out of an internal company uh, game jam. Hmm. Which, oh, and that's by the same company made Octodad, which is the game I was thinking you were talking about. Uh, so I haven't found the total number of sales for Goat Simulator, but I did find uh, an re- estimate of their daily installs. Uh, so they're saying that uh, Goat Simulator gets 1,300 daily installs. So even with the price of it being two ninety nine now, which it was much higher, uh, they're estimating about four thousand dollars daily revenue. Daily, it's not impressive, too shabby, huh? That's impressive for something that was created in probably a few days. <laughs> the yep. initial stab. Yeah, pretty cool. We're doing it wrong. Why are we making podcasts for the last eight years? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, for real. And so if you if you just Google a game jam games, you'll find a bunch more, but those are just the ones that I had kind of recognized, so I kind of grabbed them. Uh so we talked about Ludum Dare and they do it twice a year. Uh Global Game Jams uh is apparently the biggest. Uh at least um that's in the, their marketing speak. But it's actually uh, got a big emphasis uh on physical presence. So what they do is it's basically a big event that happens at a certain time all around the world and they get people to basically run these events in different areas. So there's one in New York City, one in Cairo, one in uh, you know, the Philippines, whatever. I'm sure there's more than one in all of those places. But uh, let's see here. I got some stats. Uh, in January of last year, they had 934 locations across the world, 118 countries, and they created in those locations 9,601 games in a weekend. And that's wow. coming up. Yeah, and I couldn't find any numbers on how many people there were, but uh, this is an event that really focuses on teamwork. So I imagine it's going to be, you know, 10,000 times something for a total number of people that were involved in this, which is really cool. Now, here's one that's near and dear to my heart. It's 7-Day Roguelike, S7DRL. Uh, I just love roguelike games. And uh, so... Yeah, had to include this one. It's not as nearly as big as some of the others. I've got some numbers, uh, which we'll get to when we kind of talk about the rules, because each one of these has different emphasis and different rules. So I just kind of want to throw that one out there. But I did like that, uh, just right on the kind of the front page, that they have a big uh, emphasis on not being a fast coder, but that proving that you can release a finished playable game. Now you did a you did a roguelike game a couple of years back, right? Did you was it related to seven uh, D RL? Uh, only in the sense that I wish I did seven <laughs> day roguelike. Like I've always um I've played lots of the seven day roguelikes that come out. Uh, you know, usually every year I've been slacking on it lately, last couple of years. But um, I've always been aware of it and the cool things that people do. And uh, so it's definitely a bit on my horizon. But yeah, I just, and I really like the emphasis on doing something finished there. So I thought that's kind of a cool way of doing it. So it's more about getting something done and published than it is about polish. Um, so itch.io. Now this is the one that I've kind of got my eye on the most. Itch.io, if you're not familiar, it's basically honestly more like a marketplace for kind of indie games. And uh, I say marketplace, but a lot of it's just 
free games. Like people put up their games, other people come in, play it, get feedback. Like if you want to make a, a little game, maybe try to sell it, maybe not. This is a great place to just go and do it. And they also run game jams and they provide a platform for you to run game jams for free. So remember that big calendar that we saw? I would bet money that most of these links, if you click them, would link to itch.io game jams. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking that is a good platform for us to host our game jam. And so I went and I actually set up a test one, made a private uh, super good Dave, by the way, is the one who got me turned on to all of this. So he is the inspir- he's my inspiration. He's the one beneath my wings. <laughs> a big shout out to uh, the bet meddler of the show. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> super good. So I created a super good uh, game jam and uh, tried submitting a game just to kind of see what it was like. Cause I had a lot of questions especially around like platforms and playing and judging and all that stuff. And so I got a, a much better sense uh, around that. And uh, there's one game in particular or one, uh, sorry, one jam that uh, I found on itch.io. This is the biggest one I've, I've seen so far, but uh, 18,000 entrants. That is a lot. Yep. And uh, itch.io, uh, at the time uh, I got, the, I pulled the stat, and they've had a hundred and almost basically 110,000 games that have been created specifically from game jams hosted on itch.io. Wow. And you think, like, you know, most of those, like, there's some blood, sweat, and tears that go into any coding project. So right. there's some blood, sweat, and tears going now, into the site. Let me ask you something. When, when they're setting up these games, do you think they focus first on like building their DevOps pipeline to deploy this thing, or do they focus on the unit tests first? Oh, absolutely. Uh, CI CD first, and then tests, and of course, security above all. All oh, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this is a this quite is a departure. I'll never be good at this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So uh, here is I, I put a, together a couple of reasons why I thought a person would want to do a game jam. And, uh, you know, based on the reading, this basically seems like uh, a lot of them emphasize meeting new people, uh, including virtual spaces. Uh, And we'll talk a little bit more about how the rules often go. But usually when it comes to kind of time to kind of finish the game and like do a do like a judging process, a lot of times uh, the way it works is that the people who have submitted finished games get to vote on other people's games. And that's uh, kind of a common way of voting things up. Wait, say that again. It's uh, the people who submit games are the only people who can vote on them. Ah. And there's all sorts of variations. Sometimes there's like a judge panel. Sometimes there's like a round of like public voting and then it gets weaned down to smaller round, and then it goes on to, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, but I, I just think it's really cool that uh, by having the people who submit the games be able to be the ones that also judge it, it really encourages everyone to kind of play everyone else's games. So if you submit one of these games then your game will get played because they're encouraging people to go out there and, and uh, do that voting as well. So in addition to making a game, your game actually gets played and you get feedback and you get to meet those people. And when, they, when you do a game jam a year later on the same platform, maybe you'll see that person again and you'll see the game they made this year and you remember the one they made last year. And So it's got a great way of building community, which is something, of course, we're interested in. I like it. So we, you said you are definitely looking at itch.io as the platform we'll probably use. Yeah, just see, like it's a couple of checkboxes and a submit button to get going. And so, uh, you know, I like uh, low barrier of entry. Uh, it's totally free. So cool. it just kind of makes sense to me. Excellent. Uh, obviously, if you're doing a game jam, uh, especially if you're like writing your first game or, you know, you're not, not a game developer, uh, you're going to be learning a lot. There's a lot of different things with physics and just the way you write these kind of programs is different. There tends to be like a game loop, an infinite loop. Uh, most developers I know don't ever <laughs> try. You know, there's no uh, intentional infinite loops in the code, but that's something that's super common in games, which is just kind of well, a different way of things. It reminds me of like just doing Windows app development, right? Like if, yep. if you like desktop app development, then there was a you know, main loop as well, a main event loop. Yeah. Uh, you can make a game in, uh, out of Windows components. It'd be kind of fun. I'm sure somebody has. Well, I mean, I remember, you know, back in school we had to. Yeah. 
can do that in, in, in like any of your classes, like as an assignment? A game? Yeah. Mm -mm. Uh, actually, back in high school, maybe. I think I did like a DOS game, but no, nah, I don't think anything in school, in, in, you know, graduate level stuff, none of that was ever. I don't think I ever did any games. Yeah. I had one class that was an elective, though, and it was just kind of like one little challenge was to make a GUI, a GUI game. Cool. What if you love it? I don't remember what it was about. I just remember we had one where it was some, we had to do something with a Bumblebee game. Huh. Oh, that's cool. Uh, on the uh, you have this buzz on the love it thing. Yeah, I mean this could be interesting. I've I've always been curious. I've never tried it. Never actually sat down and said, you know what, I'm going to make a little something. Yeah, and if you kind of demystify it a little bit, maybe the next time you go to learn whatever language you want to learn next or whatever framework or something, then uh, maybe instead of doing a to-do list, you'll do a little uh, simple platformer or, uh, you know, Tetris or a puzzle game or something, which is, you know, fun. Cool. Great for GitHub, blogs, Twitch. If you're wanting to get more content out, this is a great way to stream about something or have some sort of thing you can output because it, games are so visual it tends to represent really well in these sort of areas. So if you want to have something cool to show off on your LinkedIn or your profile or whatever, then what's cooler looking in the game? Are we planning on, oh, go ahead. Do I need to have like my unity 3d skills down pat? Like I need to be super polished before I start this. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, if you do want to go with unity or Python and be done. There are fantastic options for all of those. Got a list of uh, game engines coming up. Uh, Unity is uh, such a fantastic choice, though. It's, it's crazy. And uh, from what I can tell, a lot of people will start with a tutorial from Unity. There's tons of them. There's tons of official ones, even. that uh, You can go and just kind of start there, start working through a little bit. At some point, you kind of branch off and do your own thing. And there you go. You learned Unity and you made a game. Are we planning on twitching anything? Like, I, I guess I'm asking a bunch of specifics about what, what you've got in your head for, for coming up in January. Like, all right, is this going to be like a community type thing where we, where we hop on Twitch and we have a bunch of other people on there or YouTube or, or like, what are you thinking? Yeah. I mean, I was definitely thinking about uh, trying to make a game. I was going to try and take some time off work and just go in for it. Gung ho. Uh, and like, you know, I assume I would be ineligible for money or whatever. Like, I don't care about that. I just want to do it to be fun. And uh, I would, I would Twitch it. Uh, I would also love just to kind of play through other people's games on Twitch too. You know, assuming, you know, we'd have to talk about it and think about it, you know, make sure people are okay with that. But I just think it would be cool to like see my game being played by someone else and just see the things that they run into that I didn't think about kind of like, you know, user feedback testing. Live QA. Yeah. Live QA. It's being hosted on itch.io, like, anybody who was on that platform could sign up to compete in this game jam. Yeah. And that's another thing that was kind of interesting to me too. It's like, part of me was like, you know, we could like go nuts and buy a bunch of advertising and like, just try to make the biggest, awesome, most ballin game jam that ever was, or we could just talk about it on the show and the mailing list and Slack, keep it small and keep it more kind of, you know, uh, essentially the, like the people we know and love. Right. Yeah. I think, I think that's the right way. There goes our marketing skills. One, one more time. Oh, we start That's small right. and then That's next right. year. So I mean, we could be doing one of these every day. I mean, uh, you're crazy. this is the first of many. Yeah. Because uh, some of these, some of these people might go on to make millions of dollars. That's a, you know, a great way to maybe get a new career path. If you uh, end up like finding something like a super hot that really takes off and then, um, you know, making, let's say 2 million, it sells for like 20 bucks. So $400 million. So, so check this out, Outlaw. I think you might remember this. I don't know if you were there, Joe, but year, years ago, this has been years ago, we had gone to a meetup. I don't remember what the meetup was about, but there was an Android developer there. I can't remember his name, but do you remember? He, he creates crossword puzzle games. And he had entered in something. I don't know that it was a game jam, but it was something similar. But there was basically a, hey, create a game and submit your game. And whoever wins, wins. I don't remember if it was twenty or $50,000. It was a chunk of money. And he won with his first crossword puzzle game. And so he started, was like, okay, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start creating games and I'm going to publish them on Android. And then I think he started... It, that's what it was. I think it was a Xamarin meetup because he was looking to cross-platform his game. 
Yeah, I'm trying to find his name now. It was a uh, Peter something. Uh, yeah, and I'll I'll find it. But uh, yeah, you're right. It was it was we met him at a Xamarin meet meetup, and that was how he. Uh, Roger Peters is his. That's name. it. That's it. Yep. And you could find him at, like at Smarty P, and he had created a game that uh, was I think it was called Matching Go. No, Word Search Light. I think was the name of it. Uh, Oh no! I think, no, he had both. Both of those. He had two games. I forget which one was the. First. I think Word, Word Search Light. I think was the first one or something like that. But, um, but yeah, you're right. He 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 got started because he competed in a a game competition, won fifty thousand dollars for it, and that started the whole the whole thing for him. Yep. So so when Joe says that, hey, you could make millions of dollars, like, no, you totally you you totally could potentially make a living i mean super hot you could look at it and tell that it didn't start out with with amazing things and they haven't absolutely taken it to the next level and people love it because it's just a fun thing right so th this could be a nice little start to something that you didn't even know you, you'd be into you know um so the gaming industry is uh 200 billion dollars a year which is getting this is uh this is a couple years old uh, but that's about double hollywood it's a double That's the movie crazy. industry. Crazy. Yep. There's people you've never heard of that are living their entire lives making games you've never heard of. And you There's said two hundred billion. Yeah, the B. Buh. It's a lot of Instagrams. I'll include a link, uh, you know, for the curious about where we did talk about um when we met Roger Peters and, and all that. It goes back so far like we didn't even include the number the episode numbers <laughs> in the show notes <laughs> but it was like early on because uh this is like from 14 all you all your database are belong to us oh that was a which good series seems like a fitting title for this episode to talk about you know to, to reference for this episode to reference that one <laughs> since it is game related oh that's right yes Oh, yeah, I did just see it too. I just happened to see uh, in this article I was uh, getting some numbers on. Uh, the, in this article, they're projecting. So who knows if it came true or not? But uh, by 2020, esports uh, expected to have more than 70 million viewers for uh, for finals or big competitions, uh, which is more than the NBA. Which is crazy to me. Wow. Yep. Well, this industry it, is still growing. It is fun to go to the gaming competitions. I mean. If you've never been, like it's it is, you can see like it's definitely it's definitely on its way up. I mean there there have been some gaming competitions that I've gone to, and there's like full on like stadium seating around the game area, and there'll be like an announcer's booth, and it's you know fully decked out with cameras and everything, just like it would be like if you were at an NBA or whatever, you know, and and there's the stage. You can watch the the people play, but then there's like giant giant screens to, uh, you know, watch watch all the action as well as like, you know, uh, I've even seen stadium seating where it was like there were smaller monitors closer, uh, you know, throughout the seating area so that, uh, you know, in case if those the the even though they are gigantic, if it was still too far away for you, you know, there was something closer to you that you could see. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's awesome. It's awesome. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about a couple specific game jams, uh, specifically because of uh, I kind of wanted to highlight the differences between them and the way they do things and why they do them that way so we can kind of think a little bit about what we want to do. Uh, so I mentioned Ludum Dare. They're kind of like the, the big dog in the space, uh, you know, kind of, sort of. Uh, they're at least most associated with the name. And uh, they just most recently had one in October, which is uh, number 47 which is quite a lot of game jams. They had 6,000, uh, like almost 7,000 signups, which uh, they have divided categories. So you can do solos or you can do comp compos, uh, which are basically teams. And uh, so there was actually 9,000 individuals. And uh, of course, uh, some people, about 3,000 didn't end up submitting a game, didn't finish, but they got 3,206 submitted games out of it. And you can go browse all of them and play any of them right now. Thousands of games. That's pretty cool. Yep. And you can go play just the winners or the top 10 or the top 20 or whatever you want. It's all free. 
like if you're a game developer or you're interested in becoming one or just want to see some cool creative ideas uh, then i mean the world is your oyster there are <laughs> there are more games than you could ever look at and that's pretty awesome especially when some of them end up kind of really taking off and becoming big bold new concepts like the i mentioned the surgery simulator which kind of spawned off like a whole generation of games where you're like a construction person trying to hit a nail and oh you're hitting your arm you know whatever uh, you just gotta see you guys have to look at that uh, <laughs> yeah, like, the way you describe it though sounds like if you uh asked me to use the unity engine for the first time <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> right. physics wrong. Right, ah, oh, it's a nail hitting my. I turned left. Why am I going right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, there's uh there's one level I just gotta tell you where um you're in a bumpy ambulance trying to do a surgery, maybe a little dark. I don't know, but uh, I think you're trying, <laughs> trying to do some sort of heart surgery, and uh, you know, so you like maybe you go to grab the scissors and you accidentally grab the hammer or you know whatever. You get a, over a bump, you accidentally hit them with the scissors and you crack the ribs and the heart flies out. <laughs> just the kind of like level of ridiculousness that uh, that can happen. That's excellent. Yeah, I made that scenario up so that you know, like I don't know if you can actually knock the heart out, but that's the kind of stuff that uh, happens. <laughs> but it will be available in the next release. Yeah, yeah. there you go. It's a great idea. They should pay me for that. <laughs> uh, so for Luton Dare, uh, it's seventy two hours. Uh, they call it a weekend, but it you know, basically starts on Friday. Uh, you can do it alone or team. They have separate rules for teams. Um, basically just a little bit more strict. Now, Luton Dare does like for you to do your games from scratch, uh, including the art, music. Uh, they like the games to be open source. So when basically when they're asking people to kind of vote on them or they have, uh, I don't know if they do judges or not, uh, they basically ask you to kind of rank those a little bit higher if someone did the work themselves. You're going to see a lot of derivative works. Like you're going to see a lot of Mario's if you look at, you know, big game jams because people reuse art and then sometimes they'll change the color or something. Uh, but you can uh, oftentimes tell where the, the inspirations or where the assets came from. And so, uh, you know, you can also tell if someone does something, uh, what they call programmer art, where someone's obviously a coder who <laughs> try to get uh, some art in there and they actively encourage programmer art and in these types of comp- competitions. Yeah, I was just thinking like everything, <laughs> all of my art would be like, you would you'd say, well, that's a square. And I'm like, no, 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 that's a person. Exactly. And that person is going to walk through. But no, that's just a square movement. No, trust yeah. me, that's the person. Uh, uh, a long time ago, uh, well, not long, maybe a year or two ago, uh, Tor in the Slack, I don't know if you ever met him, but um, they uh, they did a game jam uh, with the team. And it was a super cool idea where there were like these lasers kind of firing through uh, a cave. And you could go and position these crystals to redirect the lasers. So you could kind of move a crystal and position it at an angle and it would bounce the laser off and kind of, uh, um, you know, achieve some sort of objective, like opening a door or something I forget now. But it was super cool. And it just always stuck with me because, uh, of course, you know, like you do it once, you're like, okay, that's neat. I can move these crystals and I can rotate the angle in order to shoot other things like enemies or myself. Uh, but, like, what if I made this crystal point at this other crystal point is other crystals so next thing you know you got this just laser just like zigzagging all over the whole level it just it was just super fun so that was really cool and i'd never seen that anything like that in the game before and never since i, was, I think the, there's uh, so many possibilities out there that you just still find ones that no one's ever done before it's just super cool now Luton dare does have a specific uh specific rules on derivative works uh, and like things that they like specifically don't want you to do, like reusing assets straight up or making them so obvious. But they do say that basically uh, major modifications are okay as long as it doesn't look too much like the the source. But that's the kind of things that like we want to think about when we're creating the rules for the game. Uh, we can have special rules about whether or not we allow uh, purchased assets or illegal assets uh, to count or to you know disqualify essentially. So something to consider. And itch.io, bless them, because they basically give you default rules. So you can just kind of go with what they have. You can kind of override and enter your own custom text for anything that you want to do. But for the most part, if you just kind of stick with their rules, like you're going to be all right. So regarding the derivative works, then like we could allow it and we could have like Mrs. Pack Outlaw. You could have Mrs. Pack Outlaw. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you know you probably don't you probably can't see where I'm going with this but 
hear me out. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That's awesome. Uh, so in particular, so Little Dare, um, they, I actually found the things that they rate people on. So um, it's a one to five rating on innovation, fun, theme, graphics, audio, humor, mood, and just the overall score. Uh, so they ask uh, kind of a lot of questions. I mean, it's one to five, so it's not too quick. But uh, at the end of that, they're able to kind of uh, average those items together and come up with a single score. And also you can go and say, hey, for uh, April of 2020, let me go see the most innovative games. So if you're trying to find some new cool mechanic or some new inspiration for a game, you can go look at the most innovative or the most fun or the most funniest uh, games going back uh, for the last 47 of these things. So you can borrow these ideas to help you stitch together what you want to create. Yeah. Oh, and great like artists, it. right? Yep. And uh, also, um, they're looking at ways to give credit for good reviews. So if you're a person who like, reviews games well, and I think they have places where you can give uh, specific feedback, then uh, you know, they want to have that some kind of factor somehow into maybe your game score, or give you some sort of like gamification there. Uh, nice. I don't know if this is such a tiny game, but it's interesting. Wow, I'm uh, looking at this one. There's actually like, because <clears throat> I, I was kind of poking around on the, the Ludum Dare just to see some of the games and I saw what you were talking about where like, you know, the results of how they would rank them, you know, overall fun innovation. And, and I didn't realize like, Oh yeah. Like you just said, you like, you could go and look, Oh, just let me see the most innovative one. So the most innovative one, I guess for the last game jam, or I don't know if this is of all time. I don't assume it's of all time, but uh, the phone tree of despair <laughs> and to play it, you actually call a phone number. Whoa, that's cool. That's like, definitely unlike any game I've, uh, but yeah, like your your, it's phone tree of despair is a game where you navigate a phone tree while trying to avoid getting stuck on a hold loop. Wow, <laughs> that's cool. And uh, yeah, you know, I I talked about games being visual, but some of the coolest games I've I've heard about coming out of Ludum Dare. Some there's one I heard of uh, many years ago where, um, where there was there was nothing to see. And you would just have to navigate by sound. Mm. Uh, and um, yeah, it's just really cool. And so you imagine there's a lot of interesting stuff you can do just with sound. And if you kind of impose that limita- limitation on yourself or some other limitation, uh, you could actually make some really cool experiences that obviously you're never going to see that in a triple A game, at least not 50, 60 hours of that kind of game loop. Um, maybe. But uh, the, that kind of stuff, like in, you know, phone phone loops and things like that are like those kind of things are just rampant just cool ideas that don't really fit very well in, in other categories man uh, some of the graphics too are like considering how short the you know the, the time is yeah you know, especially the teams so yeah. you might you'll find teams maybe where they'll have like one artist one sound designer one coder and they'll just all go split their separate ways to do the thing. You know, they knew the game themes kind of ahead of time. They were thinking about it. Maybe they had some ideas going in and they just like go for it. Man, I need like one Kubernetes guy, one <laughs> Yeah, that's one thing. Like, um, did you see this a couple of weeks ago on uh, Hacker News where someone made a, a game where you would play kind of a, you'd like shoot uh, basically your pods in your Kubernetes cluster so you could like kind of shoot a pod until it would explode and it would actually kill it in Kubernetes and so it was like a way of like testing your uh, Kubernetes cluster but also shooting things. That's pretty awesome. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. So that was neat. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> and you see a lot of education games too like even uh, games like how to type or even those like little games you're like math blaster type stuff or like little things like that when you were a kid like that, that kind of stuff, it just fits really well for like, you know, games like this. It's like, hey, let me make a, we spend the next two day, ga- days uh, making a game that teaches kids how to do long division or something like that. That's awesome. That is. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, sir, but they don't teach long division anymore. It's all about partial quotients. Oh, yeah, I've seen you draw the lines. <laughs> I know I just hit a trigger word on like every parent that listens that has had a kid go through Common Core. They're like, oh my God. I'll yeah, know. new math. Yeah, new math, exactly. 
so Global Game Jam, I actually kind of uh, like talked about them already. Basically, uh, they're the ones that do things in physical locations. So looking for hosts. As far as I can tell, it's not been rescheduled for 2021. Sounds like there are all systems going. I did it in uh, 2020, and it looks like they're going to try and do it again. And if you're interested in running a Game Jam in your area, then go to globalgamejam.com, and, or sorry, .org, globalgamejam.org, and you can uh, go to slash running a jam, and uh, you can you can do it. You can sign up and uh, they've got some rules there. They kind of, they want you to basically run public events. They don't want you to just say like, Hey, me and my friends are going to jam over here. If you run a meetup or you're involved in a meetup and there's some people that are, you have a space to do it. It might be great to say like, Hey, uh, my SQL Saturday group is going to be doing a, we're going to be working on a part of the global game jam here on Saturday. So come on down to the office, hook up your laptop and spend the next 48 hours eating pizza and making the game. Well, this is awkward. You also have a SQL uh, Saturday group. <laughs> Who doesn't? I think they're everywhere, aren't they? Like I know Orlando has them. Orlando has them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so seven day roguelike. I already mentioned that they're kind of one of my favorites. They recently swapped over to using itch.io's uh, website, and so because of that, it's really easy to like go click on uh, the twenty twenty jam and see uh, what's been uh, you know submitted for that one. I don't think there's a date yet for this year. But some of these are really cool. I'll tell you, one of my um, favorite ones uh, was uh, it was actually a, a host of the Roguelike podcast, uh, Roguelike Radio, who did this game where, um, I'm probably going to butcher the description here, but basically you played a character who walked around on a little grid. And the longer you walked around, uh, the more likely this kind of, uh, this ghost would come to kind of haunt you. And so your goal was basically to try to, go around and kind of fight the monsters and collect the loot so that you'd be strong enough to face off this ghost. But it had this really cool theme where the ghost, uh, I forget what it was the ghost kind of represented like anxiety or depression. And uh, although the little monsters you would fight would be like just little insecurities and uh, little things that kind of make you feel bad. And the, the items that you would collect to fight these things were the things that would make you feel good. So it was kind of like this cool take on like mental health Hmm. And uh, and it was all basically ASCII art. So you were this little at symbol walking around trying to fend off depression, which was kind of inevitably coming for you. And you just had to like try to kind of buck up the strength to to face it. That's uh, cool. It was just a cool idea. And so it explored a really cool theme and idea with literally text. And so the last one had 209 entries. So it's smaller. It's seven days. But I've seen several of these games go on to Steam or just other kind of um, notoriety. And a lot of these uh, I've seen Twitchers and whatnot. So, uh, you know, I'm more involved kind of in the scene. So uh, now they in particular do recommend planning your game ahead of time. So uh, even on the podcast, I remember they would kind of talk about their ideas for the, for the next year. And uh, I, I think I mentioned this earlier that they basically they really want you to – uh, I think I said that they don't want to polish, but they do, this one does in particular really want a polished game that's easy for people to pick up and understand. And I think with roguelikes in particular, they tend to have like a lot of like pixel graphics. And so if you, yeah, you know, it's kind of hard to get someone up to speed and explain the rules of the game if all you've got are like little at symbols and you know letters running around. So I think they really want a big emphasis on that. Uh, and they're very permissive of third-party libraries and mods and uh, all sorts of stuff. And so the, the one I talked about, like the one where you're kind of like f- fighting off the ghost, uh, that was actually a mod of another game. So the person was able to just kind of focus on their rules and use an existing game engine to kind of get past that, the boring stuff, if you will. Cool. Yep. And you mark your done, your game is done or incomplete. And when so. you say boring stuff, you're saying like all the stuff that I would get bogged down into like, okay, how do I draw again? <laughs> right, exactly. So uh, Roblox in particular. It look like a normal face. <laughs> yeah. There's some definite com- commonalities. Like you're probably going to have a maze. It's going to be turn-based. It's going to, you know, you're going to have maps. There's like these things that are just like every roguelike game. And if you, you know, are doing your 20th seven-day roguelike challenge in a row, Maybe you don't want to program that again. And they said, you know what? Screw it. It's fine. You don't, we don't expect everyone to go out there and like re-implement a star. Use whatever packages you want. Use whatever tools you want. We're more focused on you delivering a polished experience and hopefully, you know, having a good time. So itch.io is uh, kind of, I would say like, it looks like they're the centerpiece for running game jams nowadays. It's like most people are running their game jams on itch.io. 
And for the most part, the rules are r- roughly laid out uh, based on Ludenjare, but you can uh, add your own criteria for scoring. You can override sections for rules. Uh, you have a couple of nice checkboxes and they just give you a bunch of places to just put text in. So if you don't want whatever text they have or whatever rules, like fine, just pop in your own. It's really flexible in an easy way. So it's not like a million radio buttons, just text areas if you want them. Uh, they also had some cool stuff. Um, so I, I did go ahead and create one of these and just to see kind of what that looked like. And some of the cooler options that they did actually have spelled out were the ability to have rank jams, uh, which is the uh, where people could vote on submissions. So we could have a public jam where anyone in the world can go and vote. So everyone can go on Facebook and say, hey, vote for my game. Or, or maybe only the people who actually submitted a game can do that. Maybe you have a panel of judges that all have like special accounts and say these are the judges and they get to pick. And maybe there's no ranking at all, whatever you want to do. Hmm. Uh, they have options for doing things like hiding the results so people don't see if there's like one clear leader taking off and, you know, kind of skewing the results, uh, things like that. Same with the uh, submissions. So that was all really cool. And then, uh, and then I found this. And I had not heard of this before. And so I kind of saved this one for like the last specific bit here. Have you ever heard of GMTK? Great minds think, no. <laughs> yeah, I still don't know. Like I even looked at it and I saw oh, Game Maker's Toolkit. Ah, there you go. Okay, what is that? <laughs> it sounds like some sort of like, I don't know, product. Uh, oh, it's a YouTube channel. Wow. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's literally a video game analysis series created by uh, Mark Brown, who's a video game journalist. And uh, yeah, it just talks about making games. So I didn't expect that. They've got a Patreon. They're literally, it's just content about making games are on Tumblr, uh, et cetera. Well, I've never heard of it before. Uh, but in the last game jam they ran, they had... 5,377 submissions. So that's a completed game submitted. They got 143,000 ratings for those games. So let me just do a little bit of math here. Carry the one. Yeah. Divide by pi. Uh, so roughly 28 people uh, played each game, which is pretty nuts and pretty cool, I think. Uh, now I did. I was able to find their theme last year, which was out of control. So you might be able to think of like a couple of cool ways of uh, spinning that. And yeah, I've seen a couple of sites where you could do things like um, kind of spin a dice to come up with themes. So maybe say like roll a dice, but like okay, the theme is out of control. Roll the dice again. I'll say uh, it must be black and white. Roll the dice again. Like uh, it's a racing game. So now you got to make a racing game that's black and white uh, has something to do with out of control. And, you know, however much time you have to do it over the time period. And now their rules in particular, uh, they say it must run in Windows or it must run in a browser. It always seemed to me like running in a browser is a pretty huge advantage for getting people to play your games. But, you know, it's, I never would have imagined that so many people would download and install games, which are just kind of arbitrary code, but people do it all the time. Yeah, I was going to say, that, that kind of scares me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Scares me too. But uh, I'll figure for the game jam, I'll set up a virtual box. Any, anyone that has ever spent any time looking at uh, anything security related or <laughs> listening to anything security related. And then here's Joe Zach advocating for like downloading and installing just random code. Yeah. And that seems crazy to me. Uh, so that's something to consider for our game jam. Like we could say your game has to be uh, open source buildable from GitHub from source and so we may like say hey people don't get to submit games they submit links to github that's yeah, one way know. to deal with it we'll have to look into it i'm not sure i mean because yeah. even then there's there's bad code yeah. on github that you oh can... yeah for sure i'm like uh hey joe have you been paying attention lately for sure yeah 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 so I'm that's super that's super this. scary to me but people are people are doing it somehow buy like another machine air gap it and then right <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the one that you would uh run the mach- run this heart these games on yeah so I, like i wonder like somebody has to have written that article like game jam protect yourself 
<laughs> I don't know. So yeah, again, we're not in marketing. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's probably why we're talking about security concerns. Uh, and also at the same time, trying to encourage you to join our game jam. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I keep finding games about like protecting and weird stuff that have to do with game jams. I like the browser based better. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but then you could always do web as a web assembly, right? And then you're running C code in there anyway. So are you that much safer? I'm guessing it's sandboxed. Yeah, you're sandboxed to the browser then. I'm sure there's no hacks for that. Well, <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. But you have that risk on every website you go to. True, true, true. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, build another machine just for the browser. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> So in this case, uh, they did say uh, most code had to be written during the jam. And it was a code-focused jam. But whatever art and assets you have rights to, go for it. So if you just want to go to the Udini Marketplace, buy a bunch of 3D spiders or whatever, and uh, go for it. Most code? Most code. So you could write some of it ahead of time. You can write some of it ahead of time. Yeah. And so I'm glad that you brought that up because uh, that is the kind of things that I keep getting hung up on thinking. And I would say that this basically never worked because I think like, well, I'm just going to write the game ahead of time and then come in there and like, you know, put, throw a coat of paint on it and call it done. And you could understand how people will do that. I'm sure if you have 5,000 submissions, at least one of them's going to come in with like a either a tutorial or a modded game or a game that they've already written and drop it in there. And you just got to kind of hope that the, the voting washes that out. Right. They're, they're missing the spirit of the contest at that point. And that's why it's something um, I haven't been able to find any game jams, uh, at least no big ones that offered big prizes. And I think that's probably part of the reason. Cause I thought initially too, it's like, Oh, we should do some really awesome, amazing prizes. We should give away car, a car to the winner, or uh, I don't know. We should give away wow. MacBook pros. Yeah. Hundreds of them. Uh, the top, <laughs> the top hundred entries. But then uh, the thing is like having those kind of like prizes, it kind of uh, encourages people to really want to win rather than wanting to do it for the funsies. Right. So, yeah. So I've, I've been kind of wrestling with that, but it's something to think about. And uh, you, you could also imagine too, like, so if you say, you know, we don't want people bringing in the full done, done code game. Well, what if you wrote a little game engine of your own? Is it fair that someone else could use a third party game engine or library for something but you can't write you can't use the package that you wrote or you can't use the framework that you set up and that you use for fun like that seems weird doesn't it yeah yeah it's it's hard to lock down some of that stuff because really what you're going for is creativity fun all that kind of stuff so yep leverage the tools that you have access to right but it, yeah. it really does make the most sense so maybe we make a rule that says that the game has to be open source. You don't have to publish your assets, but the, the game has to be open source. And so if we go there and see that it's all copied from somewhere or something, then you're not going to get as favorable of, you know, judging, probably. So I should run it through an obfuscator. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like how you think. Yeah. <laughs> that, you'll probably win. And uh, so in this case, they did. Outlaw does outlawish things. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so for our first thing, I thought it kind of made sense to just log it down to the people that uh, submitted games. It just seems easier that way. But I did think uh, GMTK, a great way to find new people for the next year's Game Jam is to just make the judging public. And then uh, what they did is they had a, a series of judges who would go and judge the games. Uh, the, uh, so sorry, I think I said this wrong. So basically they had public judging. And then from there, they took the top 100 games that people voted up. And then they had a series of judges go and do a second pass, come up with the top 20. And then the, the person who runs the YouTube channel went and played all 20 of those, probably on YouTube, and found out, I think he did a little spiel on them, and uh, then ended up picking the, the winners. It was super cool. Cool. Yeah, and there, the things they emphasized were fun, originality, and presentation. And uh, oh, one thing I did want to hit on, too, that I saw on default on, uh, I think it was default on itch.io, but definitely for GMTK, is they had a couple legal rules that basically said that uh, anything that you make during the jam is your property and anything you submit may end up in a YouTube video without your express permission. So that was really good. So just because you submit the game, we don't have any rights. We like Cody Fox couldn't go and sell your game. Like that would be crazy, but it's nice to spell that out. And uh, you still have hundred percent rights to it. It's your baby. 
But I like the idea that you're kind of consenting implicitly to let us feature it in a video or something like that. Yeah. So like if you, if you did that judging, like what you said, where the judge plays the top 20, maybe on YouTube, then. Yeah. 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 It would suck if one of those people DMCA, the person said, you know, (laughs) you're showing my content probably would never happen, but yeah, it's kind of cool. Well, because I mean, it it wouldn't make sense because if, if you did do a YouTube video, you'd be like, Hey, check out what so-and-so made. And it's, it's almost like free publicity for them, but, but it is nice to have it called out. Yep. I'd imagine there's different rules for teams though, too, right? Like who, yep. who owns it in that regard, you know, cause you don't want to have a fight if somebody makes super hot and, right. and all of a sudden it's, uh, you yeah, know. My- exactly. Exactly. Yep. I might say that that would be super bad. That would be, so- I think <laughs> right. so. I think you could say that. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. And then, uh, so I got a couple links here. One was the stay safe jam, which was, you know, it's kind of like a, looks like a COVID kind of oriented, uh, so like a theme about just safety. And then uh, GMT games, if you just look at these, I mean, it's just hundreds of super, super cool games. I keep saying super a lot, but you know what? It is super. <laughs> thanks for asking. <laughs> also, huge thanks to Super Good Day for inspiring all of this. Don't forget. That's right. We're on theme. Uh, and I just love the art. I want to play all of these. So, yeah. So we'll we'll have links to those again. So all very exciting see this is okay go look go look at that last uh link that you sent uh, yes um, uh, the stay safe jams and and find lisa helps shopping and just just like the thumbnail for it alone is all you got to look at and that's the kind of art that i would be submitting say what lisa lisa helps shopping don't click on it. <laughs> when I clicked on it, I, it didn't see. I didn't see. <laughs> yeah, it looks amazing. She's picking up uh, toilet paper. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and you can see the the guy and uh, the guy and his daughter who made the game. There's a little picture of them there. That's cool. That's awesome. Oh wait, where did you see that? Uh, I just bounced over it. Uh, the one I like, <laughs> just based on picture, uh, the most was is called support group, and uh, visual novel. Uh, <laughs> students responding to code but the person's like wrapped up in a blanket with their laptop uh, just doing their thing <laughs> but then i saw my true favorite which is a game called with seven cats which uh <laughs> it looks like it, they're basically a person and seven cats in this little tiny room cave thing and <laughs> the person's trying to take care of these cats like feeding them and, and scooping their poop and whatnot uh while also trying to just navigate around this small space with seven cats that stresses me out even thinking about it. Yeah, I can relate to this, so. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. All right, so it's that time of the show where we ask if you have a free moment. It's getting close to the holidays. You'll probably have lots of free moments where you want to sneak away from all your loved ones. <laughs> so if you get a chance and, and you find yourself in front of a computer or on your phone and, and bored, you know, Leave us a review. If you if you want to know how you can give back, just put a smile on our face. You can go to codingblocks.net slash review and leave it. And and again, we, we love reading them. It truly does make our day. So thank you for all who've done it. And thank you if you're considering doing it. And with that, we head into dad jokes. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with a better name for it off the top of my head and uh, I've failed. Um, okay, so, so real quick, uh, from Super Good Dave. Hey, might have heard that name once or twice. Uh, why do programmers prefer dark mode? I don't, I don't know. know. Because light attracts bugs. Oh, man. Oh, that's good. Man, you just did the Jeopardy music did you uh, that, that makes me so nice. sad like seriously moment of silence for that guy golly 35 years of alex trebek yeah wow. we're gonna have a moment of silence now how are we gonna have a moment of silence keep talking I, it's it's it hurts man <laughs> i don't even like thinking about it <laughs> all right sorry moving on okay then all right so uh but also i do have one other joke that's similar that I thought I would share. That's pretty good. You know, pick me back up. Out, um, light 
How many programmers does it take to change a light bulb? None. None. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like both answers. Uh, none is the correct answer. They prefer dark mode. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, honestly, though, it's time for Survey Says. All right, so uh, a few episodes back, we asked, <clears throat> when a new mobile S update comes out on iOS or Android, do you update as fast as possible? I can't get the bits fast enough. Or wait for a stable release. Or never update. All right. Now, you're asking, oh, who's he going to say goes first this time? Well, you know what? Uh, Tutko on Slack gave me the most awesome way to remember this. So he suggested, hey, uh, since you can never remember who goes first, why don't you just set it up so that on the even episodes, one person goes first and on the odd person, odd number episodes the other person goes first and i was like oh my gosh why have we never thought about this this is a genius idea thank you you're amazing so here's the thing uh a is the first letter of the alphabet which is an odd number and j is the 10th letter of the alphabet which is an even number so joe you're always going to go first on the even numbers and alan you're always going to go first on the odds oh genius that's a lot of thinking. <laughs> so, this is episode 146. Now, if you have carried the, the two and you forgot and you, and you, you remember to divide by pi, you would know that it's – um whose turn is it? It's Joe's <laughs> turn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, Joe, who do you think uh, – I'm sorry. What do you, who do you think should go first? No. Uh, what do you think the answer is? Uh, 100% ever update. Never update 100%. Okay, 100%. with confidence. That's, uh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go in a different direction. I'm going to say update as fast as possible, and I'll go with 40%. 40% update as fast as possible. And you know what? This is kind of timely because we're, we're recording this, and Big Sur just recently came out. And <clears throat> I don't know, like when, when Big Sur came out, did you go like, oh, let me go update the Mac? Or were you like, oh, I'll just wait. If it prompted me, I hit update. <laughs> you didn't go looking for it then, is what you're saying. I, I didn't go looking for it, no. So when, so when that Windows uh, 20 V2004 came out, you didn't go looking for that one either? Uh, I did go looking for that one. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Okay, so if it's Windows, you go looking for it. If it's Apple, you're like, hey. Well, Windows had like Linux love in it, right? Like, so that was a big thing. Mac already had Linux love in it, so I didn't care. Okay, okay. Well, um, this is going to come as a shock. Being that, uh, Jay-Z went with 100%. Oh, I thought you said one. For uh, never update. Uh, but no, no. <laughs> you know... We really got to get you into a math class. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the, the odds of it being 100% on any one of them, unless or there's like only one choice. Maybe that's what I'll do for you in the future, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and then it'll be I'll 50%. Just yeah, 50%. Yeah. I think. <laughs> you probably would do something like that. Yeah, no. Uh, the answer, the winner is update as fast as possible at 70 percent oh wow okay yeah. which I, I, I felt good about because anytime like you know there's an ios update i'm running around I'm, I'm updating everything you know telling every family member like hey update the devices you know or or if there's a mac update i'm like okay let me update so. I, do, I do it for security purposes mostly and features secondarily, right? Like I don't even know half the new features that were included on any particular update, but but it's more about security. Like I, yeah. If it's a if it's a big major release, then it's probably in for me. It's more about the features than it is the secure security. 
when it's the minor point releases, then it's definitely the security. Because like on the major releases, I mean, there that's never a security based. No, no, uh, it's feature. Yeah. So like the Big Sur that you know update that's that's nothing to do with uh, you know wanting wanting um, security updates. So. All right. Well, uh, here for this episode, um, you know, very related to it. We ask nothing because I want to tell you another joke. Ha, tricked you. All right. So uh, how about this one for you? This is a thinker. You ready? Because I don't like computer science jokes. Not one bit. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay. That's awful. I like it. I like it. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to get any better. So, I mean, they're dad jokes. They're not supposed to. Um. All right. So, for this episode, we ask, "What kind of game do you want to make?" Your choices are puzzle, because I want my players to suffer as I have suffered making this game. You should also like lose a piece of it. Uh, you know, just to make it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first person shooter. What else is there? Or roguelike, because procedural generation is kind of like a game for the programmer. Or RPG. It's kind of like writing fan fiction, and that's awesome. Is it? Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to make you say that. <laughs> or, I wanted, but I wanted a lot to say it. Or platformer, like Mario, not the shoes. Which, by the way, shouldn't that be called just a side scroller? Uh, yeah, I guess so. They always called them platform games, though. I, but that was because games. that's but that's because that was the the game for the platform, though, right? Like Sonic the Hedgehog or whatever. So yeah, I think I think side scroller is probably a better one. Yeah. Okay. Or racing, because Mama, I want to go fast. <laughs> I knew you'd have one. <laughs> So inside baseball here, I, I actually wrote these and I tried to write them like what Outlaw would say. And uh, for racing, I just couldn't think of one, but I knew Outlaw would have something from Talladega Nights. <laughs> I want to go fast. Here, baby. Pound, six, eight ounce, baby Jesus. Uh, or lastly, turn-based strategy, because all your base are belong to me. All right. So, uh, you know, one more, because we were talking about um, updating, uh, you know, uh, your, your OS and everything. And that reminded me because, you know, there was that whole thing about why uh, Windows skipped, um, the, you know, they had version seven and they had eight and then it skipped nine, right? And we, we know why, right? No, Wait. seven, eight, nine. Seven yeah. eight nine. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Not really, but you know. Yep. That's the funny answer, right? Uh, so, <clears throat> why didn't four ask out five? I don't know. He was two squared. Oh man, <laughs> that's that's a good one. All right, so we uh, talked through the major kind of game jams. We told you what game jams were. Uh, how about? we talk about how you can actually get your game jam on here. So, uh, you know, we mentioned already indiegamejams.com is your go-to website to find a game jam that is happening right now. You can find one probably that started five minutes ago on the site because there's so many of them. So just go and sign up for one. And also, uh, we'll be doing one in January. So, hey, you got some time off around the holidays. Why not uh, pick up a game engine and start um, mucking around a little bit and see if there's something you want to do? Because we're looking at doing the 21st to the 24th of January. And it's going to be fun. I mean, like, are there some libraries, though, that you have available to, like, help kickstart? Like, if you've never written, like, you had already done, like, a a roguelike game before right did you start that from absolute scratch or did you have some js libraries because it was web-based right so i'm assuming you had some js libraries i've done a couple ever since i've been alive i've been trying to make video games (laughs) (laughs) uh mostly poorly always sorry always poorly um but uh yeah there's in fact there is a fantastic library for javascript free open source 
<coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, called uh, ROT, R-O-T dot J-S. I forget what it stands for. Probably roguelike open toolkit or something. It'll generate maps for you. It'll take care of movements. Uh, it has like really nice patterns for uh, setting up like, monsters and just like the common kind of things you can do. And it has uh, a support for even uh, visualization. So you can have like tiles rather than just ASCII. And uh, so I did a couple things with that just for fun. Uh, but actually, I would say if you're trying to decide what tools to go with, uh, first, I think you kind of decide like whether you want to just pick a tool that you want to learn because you want to learn the tool or the, the ecosystem or if you want to use what you know. And if you want to pick a tool that's really popular, I mean, Unity 3D is your choice. It compiles to native, it compiles to phones, it compiles to web, just by default. Unless you go out of your way to break that, it's going to do that. And all the tutorials are going to be done in such a way that you can do that. And so you can literally say Unity 3D tutorial and get started today learning Unity 3D. And they've got tutorials for roguelikes and third first person shooters and third person shooters and racing games and every game under the sun and they're all like insanely good. And, and just to, to go a little bit further in this unity 3d is C sharp, right? Yeah. Yep, so, so there's some love there, um, which is really good stuff. Unity 3d. I've never really looked into it that much. Is this something to where you kind of need to determine the type of game you want to make first before you choose which one you want to go? So for instance, if you wanted to do, um, a, a rogue game, would you use Unity 3D or would you use one of the tool sets out there that's already kind of built around the rogue stuff? So I would honestly say like, if you are just want to make a game and you care more about the output than like how you're doing it, then I would just do Unity 3D. It's such okay. a major player. There's so much information out there on YouTube and tutorials and, and the marketplace makes things really easy. They have a marketplace with free assets. So if you don't want to spend any money, you can just go there and find tons of 3D spiders or whatever levels or music or sounds. Uh, and so it's just such a great way to get started. Uh, but then again, if you like really want to use your favorite language, say you love uh, Rust, you can also just search Rust game engine. I guarantee you'll find at least three of them because programmers like making game engines apparently. Okay, cool. Um, I, another heads up, even though I've never written a game, I have, uh, you guys have heard of Humble, like Humble Bundles yeah. for games. They, a lot of times, will come up with things where it's like, hey, you can buy game assets right now for 15 bucks, right? And it'll give you yeah. a thousand images and whatever else. So um, just something to be aware of. If you are actually interested in doing this, want to make them, you know, go, is it just Humble.com? I don't even remember anymore. I was Humble. Oh, Humblebundle.com. Yeah. Yeah. Humble, if you go to humble.com, it'll take you to humblebundle.com. Um, so, yeah, they, a lot of times they will have, like right now, they even have a thing on here, Java programming and more from O'Reilly. Like they'll, they'll have assets and stuff you can do. So, no, that's really interesting. So you're saying Unity 3, 3D. Um, cool. What else, what else we got here? Yeah, so that's my that's my personal recommendation. Is like if you have no other dog in that fight, just go through Unity 3D. It's in C sharp. It's great to use. The tutorials and documentation is fantastic. Uh, other big players in the, in the uh, ecosystem are Unreal, of course, and you'll see that's super popular in the uh, like triple A uh, realm. But it is free for uh, like I think it's like it's free until you make a hundred thousand dollars in revenue or something. And I'm sure they've got some, you know, paid fancy features too that uh, you can kind of make use of. But for the most part, if you're just doing an indie game, uh, and Re Unreal is a, a great option. Yeah, I think it is uh, C++ only, I believe. So, you know, there's that's quite a hill to mount if, you, you know, you're not used to C++. So uh, I, I kind of feel like C Sharp is one of those languages that, like, it's easier to learn for anyone who's programmed in any other language. So if you've programmed in JavaScript, it's, you're going to be able to pick up C-sharp pretty easily. C++, there's going to be some things you got to learn. Right. You're dealing with addressing and it just, you know, unless you're programming in native languages, you're going to be learning the tool and the language at the same time. Uh, Goda is another one. I believe it's native, um, but I keep seeing this one pop up. It's uh, got a big emphasis on 2D games in addition to 3D. And uh, yeah, it, it looks really nice. It looks like people are doing some really cool professional stuff in it. And uh let me see. I'm not 100% sure that it's exclusively native, but I believe that it is. Yeah, C++. 
but it, uh, the results look quite nice. Now, I would say it's so Unity 3D. I don't know if they even go by the name of 3D anymore. I should probably should check that. But uh, you can do 2D games just as easily. They literally, you just drop a D. Yeah, they don't even call it 3D anymore. It's literally just Unity. Okay. That. Yeah, that's why I asked the question. All right, cool. Uh, Game Maker is kind of like a, it's more targeted towards um, like non-programmers. There's a lot of things you can do with like drag and drop, but it's actually a lot of fun. I, I, uh, I own a copy. There's also a RPG Maker. So if you want to make an RPG, then like a traditional, like maybe like a JRPG, like Super Nintendo style uh, RPG game, RPG Maker has you set. You basically do a new game and you've got an RPG there and it's just up to you to enter the story, the battle systems, the monsters, the items, like all that kind of stuff. You can really just focus on your game because this is a genre that is so well defined and they have very specific tools for it, which is amazing. And there's a lot of games on Steam that make a lot of money and do really well that are made with RPG Maker and the artist. So go commission some art and go make some good money. Uh, app game kit i forget what this was uh, i just kept seeing it come up when people would ask about doing game jams um, it says it's ideal for beginners hobbyists and indie developers okay yeah, it looks nice now, there was one other i heard about i guess i uh, didn't put it on here i can't remember what's called but uh, it's a really small tiny game engine the app game kit looks interesting too. It's a ve- it handles most platforms: iPhones, iPads, Linux, HTML5, Raspberry Pis, Mac OS, Windows, and Android. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, that's good. And uh, yeah, so pretty much like I looked for Kotlin the other day, and there were several choices for me, and so I went with like Corge. It's like Forge with a K for Kotlin. Uh, Pi game is what I've been doing with uh, uh, Python. If you want to do something kind of more native in C Sharp, just like Mono game. And I mean, literally any language that you are working with and you enjoy doing. Uh, JavaScript has several. Big surprise there. Uh, Pixie is a really popular one there. And that uh, lets you do it in a browser. I'm sure there's like five made on Node that are really popular and well documented. So uh, that's all really good. And of course, on um, popular tools, you got to mention the, the assets, things like... Uh, the music and the art, sound effects, uh, things like that. Even um, there's really cool tools and plugins and li- libraries for doing things like um, conversation trees, like in a video game where you're talking to a character and you could say this or that and you want to kind of spell that out in a declarative way. Um, a star algorithms for pathfinding, things like that. I mean, programmers love making this stuff. And so if you can think of some system or some something uh, that you want to have in your game, like you should give a, a shot at looking for an algorithm or package that already does what you want so you don't have to kind of reinvent that wheel and waste your time there unless you want to hmm. well, now for was it the mea culpa does, does that mean what I think it means <laughs> <laughs> nope <laughs> that is not what I thought it meant the coup de gras uh, but not really a, oh. anyway the coolest part of the show <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about the coding blocks game jam coming up in january let me tell you first off it took every ounce of my being to not call this january every time I <laughs> I don't, oh, what's the problem there sir i know you know, i was just trying not to because it just felt a little too punny even for me you know to say that the coding blocks game jam january contest or some such so. I, I don't know why we wouldn't still go with that. I okay, don't. it's official. Game Jam? January. <laughs> January. There you go. <laughs> don't, even, don't even say Game Jam January. It's just Game January. Game January. Well, yeah. it's good because um, we actually, uh, the dates that I picked uh, do overlap with the Global Game Jam. <laughs> it's a little awkward. <laughs> um, but uh, I think we'll be okay. That's the one that has the emphasis on in person. And we, uh, we aren't in person very often these days. No. Uh, so, uh, of course, we'll have a code of conduct. We already have a code of conduct up on the website uh, for all our social kind of things. Uh, but, you know, it's it's all pretty much common sense, I think. But, uh, of course, we'll have one for the game. Uh, for voting, what do you think about the different kinds of voting strategies that we talked about? I'm fine with any of them, honestly. Like, yep. uh, I mean, I, I would be more, I guess I'd be more open to whatever the community wants to do. Mm-hmm. But... I mean, public seems like it's good because you get opinions of people that, that love to do this stuff, love to play it. 
Yeah. Um, submissions. Like, yeah, I got, I got no real opinion on it. So I kind of felt like if we were going to have uh, prizes, particularly good prizes, then I kind of felt like having judges, like, you know, a panel of judges was more important. And um, public, I thought was fine. If we said no voting at all, I thought that wasn't great because I kind of like liked the idea of having a way, like if like someone does some really spectacular something and if you go see 20 games, you're probably not going to play all of them, right? Right. I want, uh, wanted a way to kind of highlight the standouts, you know? Yeah, I, I definitely like the voting. Okay, yeah, so we're looking at basically public or... I, I was torn between like, I, I liked the idea of that if you submitted, then you could play one or, you know, play the games and then... Uh, weigh in on you know you know give your your vote but also kind of like the public too because then you know like what if you don't want to or know how to or feel too intimidated to create a game like oh you you don't get to play them and vote on it you know like that kind of that kind of sucks but i I do like that other tier where you said that uh you know based off of the decisions that other people have made that there would still be like a panel of judges would then get that final selection you know, to go from there. So I don't know. I kind of like the combination of it all. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. It is kind of sweet. like, like let's say you're the kind of person that doesn't want to go hassle your friends and family to go vote for you. And like, I, I don't like the idea that we kind of like force you to do that. So, but, but maybe having some sort of like public tier and also the panel is good. So I don't, I don't know. We can figure out. So, Hey, leave a comment yeah. uh, if you have an idea uh, because we, we are really trying to figure this out. Also, Oh my gosh, I should have mentioned this. Uh, the coding box Slack, which you can join right now free <laughs> right now like go to clingsboxes.net slash slack uh, and get in there there's a game dev wannabe channel it's literally called game dash dev dash wannabe where people talk about this stuff perfect so uh, i will be talking about the game jam we have been talking about the game gym uh, in there already so um yeah we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this a little bit there and if you have any uh ideas leave them in the comments please uh, also, uh, so theme. I, I kind of felt like uh, Dave mentioned this at Ludum Dares, where they kind of like narrow the theme down. Uh, it's a little bit more overhead, you know. It, it takes some work to do that, but it's thought it was so cool to kind of like start with a bigger number and then kind of weaning it down, just to kind of build that anticipation. I like it only because it gives people a box to play in, right? Yeah. Like if 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 you leave it too open, then a lot of people struggle trying to even get started. Yeah. So the, the idea for the theme now, oh, um, right now. Yeah. I figured we come up with like a big list and figure it out. Like either we figure out kind of behind the scenes or we throw out, I don't know, but uh, I think we, I definitely think we should have a theme because just like you said, some, there's something about constraints that set you free. Like if you yeah. tell me like, Hey Joe, go write a game. I'll be like, okay, well I guess I'll make Mario or a roguelike. But if you tell me like make a theme about the color or make a game, uh, dealing with the color orange and all of a sudden I'm like oh what about the Kool-Aid man or what about the desert deserts are orange that'd be cool you know <laughs> how do you make a game about a desert whoa what was that outlaw so now you got me thinking about Cheetos yeah <laughs> there like, you go walk, walk away and like your fingers and hands are just like caked in Cheetos dust oh my gosh that sounds like a lot of fun it's like two big hands and all you do is just collect all the dust on them cha 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 Leave handprints everywhere. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Or, or you know, you could do like a a, a spinoff of uh, Who's Your Daddy, and the baby has like Cheeto hands, and the dad's trying to like keep everything clean so that he doesn't get in trouble with the missus. Yeah, that sounds awesome, man. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm loving these Cheeto ideas. We we'll definitely have to have a theme there for that. <laughs> Uh, so uh, rules, I think this is the kind of the hardest part because uh, you know, we've got some decisions to make about basically uh, libraries, assets, and how much pre-planning we really want to encourage. Um, I'm actually open to people using libraries and assets. Like, <clears throat> Yeah, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, it doesn't bother me at all. Like I don't want anybody to just copy and paste a game. Like that's lame. But that's, that's, it's like you said, that's sort of outside the, the spirit of it, right? Yeah. You know, if, if you can use a library to get your game engine rolling and you can use the assets to make it look good without having to put in, you know, hours and days worth of work just to try and make something look halfway polished, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I like that too. To me, it's really fun to work with assets you like too. So if you right. go find some graphics that you like, it's just more fun to look at that than whatever I would draw. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. 
like that too. Okay. Um, what about a lot of platforms? So this is uh, somewhere where we could say browser only. Oh man. Yeah. That would definitely limit the choices on engines. Um, but I'm, I don't have a problem saying that. I like the idea of, you know, protecting people. I would hate to say like, Hey, people go join our game jam, go play all these games. And somebody puts a, you know, a key logger or something. Right. <laughs> Kind of the opinion that I have here applies to some of these other ones too, like rule the rules and the theme of the voting was like if there's already like in the the game dev wannabe channel, you know, developers that have already competed in some of these things or you know have have uh, participated in some of them. Like I kind of feel like their opinions are going to weigh heavier than anything that I'm going to say, right? Because like. I haven't been I haven't been involved in these game jams in the past, so I'm only thinking about it from purely a security point of view. <laughs> to where I'm like, um, I don't know that I want to just run random code on any machine. So yeah. uh, you start up a VM, it's fine. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, have you ever in your life heard of anybody escaping a VM? That never happens. No, no it never happens at all. We're fine. Yeah. I mean. You know, I mean, at least at least the one the one positive though, you know, is it being the the coding box community. But since it's going to be like hosted out on itch io, right? Then just any random person could be on it. So we might not necessarily know. It might not be a community member that we know, right? Beating in it. So mm-hmm. again, that's what puts puts me back into my like, you know, um, uh, security mode you like yeah i kind of like picture that that the the fry meme you know the one i'm talking about where he's like mm, wait a minute yep. you know like, like that's just me <laughs> and, you know i should be, um they have unlisted events so if you wanted to make a game jam and not have it be public i think they even have invitation only and oh. uh they even have like a mailing list that's kind of built in so just by joining signing up for the the mailing list they, uh, or signing up for the the contest to get on like a special list where i don't even think it shows the, the the organizers do mailing lists, but you can like send out announcements and stuff. And it's a way for them to kind of sign up, but also protect their email addresses, which is really cool. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how far we want to lock it down, but I'm in agreement. If there's people that have already done it, then, then cool. We can definitely lean on, on their better guidance for it. But <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, I think I'd almost default to a browser in this type of world. Um, Unless there was something like I wouldn't even be opposed to something like Linux if it was something where you could boot from a USB into a Linux and just run it on that, right? Like I, I don't know. There's so many different ways we could go about this, but yeah, kind of like the idea. On one hand, it's like, well, what if you want to learn Python? Then this is a cool way to like learn Python through Pygame and do something neat. On the other right. hand, I feel like, well, so what if you really know Unity really well? Oh, well, Unity you can't you can do web. So what if you say like you know Pygame really really well? And it's frustrating to you that the only way you can join this is if you have to use some JavaScript framework and right. JavaScript. Like, then that right. sucks. But at the same time, like, hey, maybe you'll learn something new. Maybe you'll like it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll just wait and get some feedback and see what people say here. Yeah. So let us know. Well, we just let Alan install all the <laughs> install on his There website. you go. Alan gets That's all right. the, the installs. That's right. All right. So uh, last one I got here is uh, prizes. Should we do prizes? <laughs> do we ask the community? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's like, so what do you guys think? We were thinking about doing uh, MacBook Pros for all entries, right? Uh, all yeah. submissions. Uh, so I don't know. Is that enough? <laughs> uh, how about a coding blocks hat for the winner? <laughs> yeah, we could we could definitely do that. Yeah, so we, yeah, I, I would definitely not have any worries about people scumming for a hat. You know, like a right. But if the prize was a thousand dollars, then I think we're going to get some people signing up from the internet, from you know whatever. Yeah, that's the problem. Like, I'm not, that makes me not crazy about it. No, nah, I, I mean I'd definitely be down with some swag and maybe a book or something. I don't know, something like that, right? Okay. I like that. Take notes and yeah, leave those comments. So cool. Okay, cool. Um. So oh, uh, one last thing I wanted to do here. I almost forgot. Are you can Steve Jobs us, Steve Jobs us with like one more thing. Put you on the spot. So uh, this will be like a little idea here. So I thought it'd be fun to just imagine, if you will, that the three of us are competing separately at a game jam, 
And you have 48 hours to do this. You can bring your own assets. So you don't have to worry about art. And uh, let's see, Outlaw, uh, your theme is stars. What kind of game would you make in 48 hours about stars? Uh, oh, you straight up putting us on the spot. Yeah. I yep. realized it was going to be like this. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I would uh, just make like a game where the stars are tumbling from the sky from the top of the screen and you had to like arrange them. They would be on all different shapes uh, or so, no, not shapes. They'd be the same shape because there's a star, but uh, different size stars. And you would try to like squeeze them in it, like, you know, get as many as you can into the screen. All right. I'll I, play that game. I'm not good at this. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Alan, pick number between one and three. Sorry. I should have done this for you. Allah. Two. Two. Uh, so your theme is renovate. Renovate. No, yep. he has to pick stars. Dude, yeah, you got stars though. No. So renovate. I'm gonna have bricks that I'm gonna try and gather and squeeze in. No, um, <laughs> I think um, uh, renovate. Oh man, it would. Yeah, be you had like, enough it, renovation, huh? Yeah, I was gonna say, man. Like I almost cut my thumb <laughs> off the other day. <laughs> Jeez. Um, no, I think it would probably be something similar to the uh, the surgery thing, right? Like you have a bunch of tools, <laughs> you go to town on a wall, right? Something like that. You got to put a shelf up and all of a sudden you knock a hole in the wall or, or whatever. Like, you know, it'd yeah. be something fun. Yeah, sounds very real. It's not far, not far off. All right. And uh, Outlaw, give me a number between one and three. This will be for me. Oh, I was going to, I was going to pick one. Uh, oh, for, yeah, yeah. You got the site. I put the link there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So your theme is Venus. Venus. Okay, so we've got the, the planet, but we've also got the, uh, you know, the gods. So I think I would make a, a game about, uh, about love. And what you would do as an agent of Venus is you would fly around as a little naked baby and shoot people and... Uh, the people would uh, fall in love. So this is a game of Cupid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, game of not, Cupid. not Venus. All right, fair. <laughs> well, they're, they're related. <laughs> Anyone else, like, as he was describing this, you know, you got, like, the love boat theme going through your mind, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Love boat. Yeah, a little sheriff. So, yeah, you'd fire, fire two arrows, and uh, you'd, I don't know, they'd, they'd fall in love. It's not a very good game. I'm not, I'm not good at this. But, you know, if I just got, like, shooting an arrow and, like, you know, the person lights up or something, that would be a win for me. <laughs> if you could tell it was a person, that would be a win for me. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> did you see uh, Lisa help shopping? <laughs> right? Yeah, that was pretty awesome. Yeah, that, that, that would be, uh, like, if I made the art that good, it would be a win. Yeah. Now, how fun would that be? Like, why can't I spend eight hours a day looking at that kind of stuff? Yeah. Because Kubernetes is so much more fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can Can I write my game in YAML? <laughs> I'm convinced you can do anything in YAML. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, YAML ain't another markup language. So uh, that's right. All right. Well, we'll have uh, plenty of links in the resources we like section for this episode. Uh, so again. If uh, give, de, bleh, 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 bleh. if game development is your jam, this one is for you. Uh, and with that, we head into Alan's favorite portion of the show. It's the tip of the week. All right, it looks like I'm still talking here. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I've been streaming some Python and Pygame stuff lately. And uh, Ian Miser, uh, also known as uh, Letrus Cthulhu uh, on the Slack and member of the Pi Atlanta uh, meetup group, uh, it's quite involved there, I believe. Um, does some streaming stuff there as well. Uh, put together an article uh, gathering resources for how to learn Python. And this was just published uh, in July, so a couple months ago. So this is a new list with a bunch of great links to resources and Reddits and Discords and books and free code camp, like 300-hour Python courses all for free. So uh, it's just a ton of resources uh, that are all really cool and all really current. And uh, you got to go check it out. 
Man, I know you've been getting into it. Do you, does Python just strike you as JavaScript? Like it, it's, it, it straight up feels like that to me when I'm coding it. Yeah, there's some stuff like it does, it's uh, maybe because it's got kind of older roots or whatever. Like uh, there's some things that frustrate me where like um, functions won't be attached to the object. Like I want to do like array.length, not len of array and stuff right. like that. And so some of the more modern JavaScript stuff just seems more consistent to me, which I never thought I'd say about JavaScript. <laughs> But that ES6 has just made it such a pleasure. And so some things like that and some of the, like the naming conventions and the capitalization, and it seems like some people just kind of have their own ways of doing things that are just like very inconsistent between like libraries. Even in the same library, sometimes it'll be like all lowercase, no spaces. Oh, this one uses uh, underscores. This one uses yeah. camel casing. And that it just drives me nuts to see all of that in one file. Um, but I mean, what I could do is super powerful and it's it's been kind of disgusting what I can do with dictionaries and lists. I mean, just things that should never work. Like It's like, oh, you want to pop a variable in here as a key or you want to use an object as a key or you want to, like, whatever. It's like, yeah, yeah, fine. It just works. Yeah, you just plug it in. It's all good. I will tell you, one of the things that I found with Python that I that just today I needed to substring a string, like get, you know, characters something to something, their way of doing it is so beautiful compared to everybody else. It's like array notation, you know, was it string, colon, colon? string, open uh, square brackets, then your start position, colon, end position. That's okay. it. It's so simple. There's no substring or method or anything like it's. It's just really intuitive. But like you said, like the len on an array, like really, why is it there a dot length on the end of it? What, what is this? So yeah, yeah it's, it, it's inconsistent, but it, it still, it just feels very, it's, it's a loosey goosey language. So it reminds me a lot of JavaScript. Yeah. But the fact that white space matters would right. make me think that it's not. Yeah. That, that was like, when you asked the question immediately, it was like, what? No, no. Why would you even say such a silly question? Well, it's like the associative arrays and all that kind of stuff. It's very much the same as JavaScript. Right. And and the duck typing and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's sort of similar type, but yeah, the spacing, the spacing is definitely different. The, the spacing drives me a little bit crazy in Python. Yeah, um, it's bit me. If he does well, I'll copy and paste something from one function to another or something. And like uh, VS code will like, help me out by tabbing or untabbing or something. And I'll like something will drop out of a loop or drop into a loop without me realizing it. And that stinks. Yeah. Uh, copy and paste has killed me in Python. No doubt. Um, all right, so I guess my tips of the week. The first one, I, I looked to see if I'd done this in the past. I don't think I had. A little with that, my tips of the week. Yeah, my tips, yes. Um, so the first one, I looked to see if I'd done this one before. I haven't, and it's surprising because this one's excellent. So Visual Studio Code, we all love it. There is an extension for it called Status Bar JSON Path Extension. And what this does, if you, it's so frustrating. If you have a huge JSON file, and you're down in the middle of it somewhere, scroll down 200 lines. You're trying to see what is the path for this particular property I'm looking at. Like the way I used to do is that I'd go up and collapse sections until I could get it to where it was something I could see. This one makes it to where you just click on the line that you're interested in and open the status bar. It'll actually show you the path to where you are in that JSON object. <clears throat> Love it. It's, it's super helpful. Um, but this is showing it in the bottom. Uh, I think this one, but does this one? On it, it's showing it in the bottom. And that's why I was questioning because I was like, hey, wait a minute. I thought it already did that at the top. Hmm. I don't have code on here though. But in the screenshot, they're showing it in the bottom. So I don't think it used to do it in the top, but I think in the newer releases it does. So maybe this isn't as useful anymore. I don't know. I'll have to check that out. Hmm. Um, that's interesting. Because I didn't notice it in the top two. All right, so see, so that one may not be that useful anymore. I've got another tip. And this one is from Micro G. And the, as always, he's got some great stuff. This one, we had mentioned Chaos Engineering or, or, you know, like Chaos Monkey from Netflix and that kind of stuff when we were going through the DevOps handbook. Or no, was it? We yeah, went through. We were talking about Chaos Monkey as part of the DevOps handbook. Okay, okay. Yeah, I thought we had. Um, so he found this thing that is, it's a GitHub page. And there are hundreds of links on here to just all kinds of resources. Everything from books to 
culture to game days, tools, all kinds of stuff. So um, if you're into that, if you're interested in testing out your distributed systems and that kind of stuff, this is a great resource. So thanks again, Mike RG for, for sending that our way. Okay. Now, um, before I give you my tip of the week, how about I first um, inundate you with bad jokes again? Okay. Okay. Now you've been warned. I lost my job at an orange juice factory. And they said I couldn't concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> one last one. Uh, these are from Super Good Dave as well. Uh, I also quit my job at the fire hydrant factory. You couldn't park near the place. Very nice. All right. So uh, for my, my tip of the week, I'm taking a different spin on uh, the typical tip of the week that we would have because I have been put in a situation where I've been like eyeballing uh, portable laptops and uh, so mostly 13 inch laptops have, have come up. So I am going to share the ones that I've had my eye on. So one of the first ones, uh, this one, I think it was released uh, sometime in the summer, this is the Dell XPS 13 developer edition that you can get with, uh, as the, as the way I'm looking at it, Ubuntu installed on it, which that's the way I would go. Uh, it's, it's $1,049 is the starting price on that right now. And, uh, you can, you know, upgrade it. So, you know, you're only going to get at that configuration, you're, you're going to get an i5, which I think would be good enough if we're talking about an ultra portable, you know, uh, laptop. Um, but you're only going to get eight gigs of Ram, which might be a deal breaker and a 256 gig, uh, MVME SSD. Now here's the thing. You can upgrade this to a maximum of 16 gigs of Ram and you're going to want to do that. You're going to want to make that decision at the time you purchase. Soldered. Yes. Unfortunately, that seems to be the way they're going. Uh, now, the, the SSD is user replaceable, but the, uh, the memory is not. And this is only true for the 13-inch the Dell XPSs. If you wanted to get like the, the 15s and up, then uh, I believe those you can replace the memory on, on those. But yeah, I don't, I don't know why they decided to solder it in on the smaller one. Maybe it was just like a, a form factor decision that they're like, hey, we, we barely have enough room to squeeze this thing in there. So, uh, you know, we can't also make it easy to get to. That's pretty. Yeah. But, yeah, oh, super pretty. I mean, like keyboard layout is exactly what – you know how I'm picky about my keyboard layouts on the, on the laptops. So uh, if you've never seen these, uh, the Dell XPSs, these – the top of – the you know, the top of the keyboard surface, like where your palms would sit, that whole piece is just a piece of carbon fiber. And, uh, you know, so, so it looks really nice. And obviously I'm sure they went with that, with the carbon fiber for lightweight plus strength. And uh, I think it works, honestly. Um, you know, so, so there's the Dell. Now here comes uh, a little bit of a, a twist on it. So there is a Razer laptop that I've had my eye on for a bit, the Razer Blade Stealth 13. And this one, okay, so here's the deal on this one. Here's honestly what I like about it is the fact that it's on clearance right now. So I'm, I'm giving you a Best Buy link because they have it $500 off. Wow. And if you walk into your local Best Buy, Mine had it even cheaper. They had like another, I don't know, 50, 40 bucks off, 40 or 50 bucks off of it. Um, so normally this laptop is $1,800 and right now Best Buy is selling it for $1,300. And that's with an i7, 16 gigs of RAM, an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1650 Ti and, 500, and a 512 gig SSD. So... Think of all those stats I just told you in a 13-inch laptop. I mean, we're, we're talking 
crazy specs, 120 hertz uh, screen, full RGB uh, keyboard, just nuts so right? More ports. Yeah, yeah, t- 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 tons of ports on it. I don't even remember all the ports on, on the Dell versus this one. Um, here's the downside, though, it, about this laptop, is that those crazy specs that I just gave you, it's, uh, I mean, it's going to chew through a battery. So you're not going to get a lot, of, a lot of battery life out of that one. I, I would expect that the Dell XPS, based on other Dell XPSs, would uh, be way up there in terms of battery performance. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head where the Dell landed. But uh, the sad thing is, is this Dell, I'm sorry, this Razer, if you, if you were interested in it, like, it would be a good, from everything that I've read about it, like it's a good laptop, you know, good hardware, especially if you're going to be plugged in the majority of the time, your ability to run it not plugged in, you know, is going to be limited. You're not, you're going to want to like try to not use that GTX uh, card as much as possible when you're out. Plus from a performance point of view, technically like the, the beauty of the performance of this is the video card because Razer actually made a conscious decision to, to lower the performance of the CPU as a way of uh, trying to keep it cooler and, you know, um, to add to the battery life. Hey, hey, so a heads up on this battery life. There's a review where some posted it three weeks ago. They said they've had it for a week when they reviewed it. The battery life, they were getting 10 to 11 hours playing YouTube videos. That's pretty good, man. Yeah, if you're going to sit in front of YouTube all day long and that's all you plan to do, maybe that's okay. But um, here's the thing is that like other reviews, uh, most of the reviews that I've read, people, the average on it was a few hours. Most people, like, and I've read a truckload of reviews on it because trust me, like I walked away from the deal because I was like, well, I guess I just can't, right? You know, hmm. and that was the thing. Because for, for, for the use cases that I was looking at, I w- you know, it wasn't going to be plugged in often. Okay. So it mattered. So the battery life was the most important thing. So, so that I include it because, again, like, you know, if you're going to be at home majority of the time, then, you know, it might not matter. But, uh, you know, yeah, so, so there's that. But here's the catch, though. Here's the one that I'm more excited about, or the most excited about. And Razer is coming out with a new one that is going to be released at the end of this month, the Razer Book 13. And this is their first uh, entry into the productivity line of hardware. Because if you've ever heard of Razer, they're always, it's always about gaming right? Gaming mice, gaming keyboards, whatever, uh, right? And, and even that other laptop that I mentioned was uh, labeled as a gaming laptop, but the, these are their productivity models. So it's still early to see like what is going to happen, um, you know, performance wise, but they look promising. So, uh, you know, the, the base model for this is going to be $1,200, uh, so a 60 hertz screen instead of uh, the 120 hertz on the on the blade stealth, uh, and this is on that blade stealth you can get up to a 4K touchscreen, but on uh, this book 13 you're getting a 1080p screen. Um, For a 13 inch, that's all you need. Yeah, honestly, I agree, uh, but. You're going to get an i5. You're going to get uh, 8 gigs of RAM, 256 gig SSD, and uh, an Iris, you know, Intel Iris XE graphics on it. So it's not the same, you know, kind of, you know, shiny, glitzy kind of specs that the Blade had. But again, if you're going after mobility, and, and, you know, not being connected to uh, a battery, to, to um, power often, then, you know, this one looks more appealing to me than the, the blade. Um, yeah, the blade, sorry. So, 
you know, the XPS 13 or the, the book 13 are my two favorites. Yeah. Cool. XPS came with uh, Ubuntu. I, I presume yes. there'd be no reason, you know, you couldn't put something else on it, but. Uh, you can, like if you, if you, when you're on the Dell configurator page, you like could you pick windows if you wanted it. And, and in fact, uh, sadly, like they kind of like try to push you into that, that way. Like, Oh, Hey, you know, you're not, you don't have windows on this thing. Do you yeah. want it? Uh, I'd much rather buy it secondhand and, uh, install it and not have whatever weirdo Dell stuff puts on it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, plus I would just stick with the Ubuntu on it and like, yeah. why bother? Right. Um, I mean, it's not like I don't have enough windows in my life. Photoshop. Know, like right. But, but yeah, so, so those are the ones I like now in, in the downside is on all of those is that, um, you know, soldered in memory is, is the way to go. So you're going to have to like pick which, what you want. Now here's the bad thing. And, and this is where like that, that razor book 13, uh, you know, is less, <laughs> is lower on my list uh, compared to that Dell. Because if you, Razer is frustrating compared to like other companies. Like you can't, you can't like say, hey, I want to buy, you know, like a, like a, a MacBook Pro and I want to start with the base model MacBook Pro, but I would like more storage or I would like more memory or whatever, right? You can't, you can't, you, Razer is like, here's the three configurations we offer, period done right and so that that 1200 uh you know price tag you can't be like oh hey i'll here's a let me throw another 100 bucks at you and upgrade it to 16 gigs of ram or something like that nope you want the 16 gig model you're going to pay 1600 dollars for that model to go up to that so that's that's the unfortunate thing about the about the razor and why i, I really like that dell xps for a thousand forty nine dollars Really like that one. Very nice. Yeah, all nice. So yeah. So if you happen to also be interested in some, uh, you know, small, portable, powerful kind of computers, then there you go. That's right. what I have my eye on. Uh, I'll take the Dell. Uh, I've had such bad luck with Dells, but I'll still take it. <sighs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, uh, so. You know, stay tuned. We're, there'll be more information uh, coming up for the uh, Coding Blocks game January. And, uh, you know, we'll have links to the events calendar that Jay Z mentioned earlier. And uh, with that, uh, subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, you know, wherever you like to find your podcast. And uh, be sure to leave us a review. You can find some helpful links at www dot codingblocks.net slash review and while you're up there go ahead and check out the show notes examples discussions more and make sure like we did have some we truly want some feedback on this episode uh drop us a comment on this episode and let us know what you think about those and you can send your feedback questions and rants to our slack channel at codingblocks.net slash slack yeah, and make sure to follow us on twitter at codingbox or head over to codingbox.net and find all our social links at the top of the page Psst, psst. Boom. All right.